All right, good evening, everybody, and welcome to another edition of Conversations That Matter tonight. I'm blessed to have another brother in the faith all the way from Edmonton, Alberta in Canada, Pastor Rohan K. Samuels. And tonight, he is an incredible thinker, an incredible theologian. In fact, he's working on his doctorate, spirit-filled pastor. He loves God. He's the husband of one wife. In fact, let me read his intro before I get too excited, because I'm really excited about this conversation tonight. So let me give him a formal introduction. Pastor Samuel serves as the senior pastor of the Freedom Life Church located in Edmonton, Alberta. He is married to his best friend, the be beautiful Janelle Samuels. Pastor Samuels embodies the rare balance of spiritual gifts and practical education experiences. And, and I'm sorry, and that connects pastoral leadership and discipleship teaching with prophetic preaching and courageous social action. He is equipped and poised to initiate theological revival, decisive commitment, and rededication to the teaching of Jesus Christ as the foundation for personal living, family stability, community development. He earned his bachelor's degree from York University, a master of theological studies degree from Taylor Seminary, and he is currently pursuing his doctorate, de doctorate degree in theology from Evangelical Seminary in Myerstown, Pennsylvania. So tonight we are excited again to have this giant in the faith, Pastor Rohan K. Samuels. Pastor Samuels, how are you this evening? I'm doing good, Reverend Elliot, man. I'm excited uh, to be a part of this conversation. I'm honored uh, that, you, that you thought of me. Um, and so uh, I'm excited to join this conversation. Um, I'm excited. Let, let's have it. Let's have it. Pastor Samuels. I am Sorry here. about that. I don't know what happened. So let's try that again. How are you this evening? I'm doing good. I'm doing good. Um, as I was saying um, before that, tech, you know, technical blackout uh, that I'm excited to be here for this conversation. I'm honored that you thought of me uh, to join you in this fashion. And uh, I'm excited to talk about God and talk about the gospel. So uh, let's 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 get into it. I'm excited. Let's do it, man. So let, let's start here. For you, why why is the cross important? Let's start there just on a very personal level. Why is the cross important? What does the cross mean to you? Yeah, I think that's a great question. Um, and I think that question is is filled uh, with with so many layers to unpack. Um, but I'll say this though, one of the reasons why the cross is so critical uh, to me is because I, I approach, um, I at least gravitate to Paul's understanding of the cross, where Paul says, particularly to the Gentiles, that it's foolishness. I don't want to deal with the Jews perspective, but to the Gentiles, it's foolishness. And I, we have to ask ourselves the question, why then is the cross foolishness? If we were to, and you know, dive into a more in-depth study of the cross, particularly uh, to its identity and reference uh, within the first century, uh, you will realize that the cross is something that is not glamorized. The, the cross, as a matter of fact, was something uh, that was despised. I, I think now in our contemporary day, uh, we we, 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 we attach the symbolism of the cross to something that, that is beautiful, that honors Christ, that brings a light of beauty. But historically, that was not the case. As a matter of fact, the cross was a place of execution. I think it's important to understand that it was not just a place of death. Um, it was a place of execution. And so when the first century Christians, when they saw the cross, when they heard the cross, when they, when they were exposed to the cross, they, they didn't somewhat had the same perception that we have of the cross. No, it was a place of terror, if I will. And so to your question, why is the cross so important? Because it brings the gravity and the purpose of the assignment of Christ into our reality. And it emphasizes strictly, and I would argue even more importantly, that Jesus, the concern is not about Jesus only dying, but the way he died. And the cross brings to our understanding that method of death. Um, and so, yeah, the cross brings that beauty, that beauty of, of glory, but also it brings us the reality of pain. Um, and so that's why the cross is quite important. Yes, sir. So as it relates to our church context, regardless of what your reformation is, why is the message of the cross crucial to 
the Christian believer into our church experience? You cannot have Christianity without the cross. Um, it's important to uh, it's important to speak of Christianity without any sort of observation or awareness of the cross. And so, as believers, uh, the crux of our identity is not in our shout. Uh, the crux of our identity um, is not even in our speaking of tongues. Depend on the Reformation you uh, adhere to. The crux of our identity is not even in the matter of how we do church. The crux of our identity and the substance of who we are is centered strictly upon the cross. There is no grace without the cross. Um, there is no hope without the cross. There is no Christianity. Um, I, let, let me go as far to say that th there, is, there is no Jesus the Messiah, Yeshua the Messiah without the cross. And so at the center of our identity as believers is where the cross situates itself. And so without the cross, we don't have a, we don't have a Christianity in which we could exclaim um, the, the, the true and living God as. Would you say, let, let me start by saying this. One of the things that I've been thinking about today as we I've been preparing for this conversation is that we have treat, traded a cross-centered theology for user-friendly Christianity. What, what would you say to that? Yeah, that, that that's a great that's a great uh, insight. Um, I, I would even propose to I would even propose um, Elliot that for many of us, I, I don't think we have fully understood the cross, and that's why there's a mishandling and a misappropriation of the cross because we haven't fully gravitated to the cross. And so, as a consequence, uh, we don't emphasize any cross-centered theology. Uh, so, therefore, it's easier to uh, fall into what you would labeled as a user-friendly uh, theology, if I will, because I, I, I'm not too sure if we have fully comprehend, at least to this, the point where we fully gravitate holistic to the cross. And I think it's important to note that for many of us, there's a recognition of the cross, at least only at particular events within the Christian liturgical calendar, uh, albeit Easter. Uh, that we just experienced last week. And I think that's when we heavily solely focus on the cross. But I think it's important to note that the cross is not to only be recognized and specialized based upon a particular season. Uh, Paul says we preach uh, this gospel in season and out of season. And so there is a continuum and a continuity of preaching the cross that will help us um, uh, restrain from a user type uh, motivational type, if I will, or even an inspirational theology that is not relegated on, or at least uh, reg regulated on the cross. Yes, sir. So you're a Bible scholar, you're a theologian. So let's go back in history for a while, uh, for a moment, I should say. So in first century, in the first century church, in the, the first century preachers, what place did the cross have in their message? Great, great question. And I think um, it's important uh, uh, to, to ask that question. And I think the best picture of that is to visit the writings of Paul, of course. And I think you and your right are a theologian, a scholar as well, too, so you can understand where I'm coming from. Um, Paul centers his preaching on the cross because his theology was infiltrated by the cross, right? And so I think it's important to note that the first century a preacher or communicator, uh, they didn't preach what they fully didn't understand um, and or at least in some case weren't motivated by. And so we, we take, for instance, Paul, you know, Paul's crux of his theology was on this Christo Christ cruciformed theology. Why? Because for Paul, the center of the gospel is the cross. And so as a consequence, Transformation does not occur independently um, from the cross. No, for Paul, Paul argues the cross as being a transformative uh, aspect by which every believer needs to be tr transformed by. You know, Paul argues to say in Romans five, uh, Romans five and eight, I believe that uh, that the assignment of Jesus the Christ was to die while we were yet sinners. 
yes, he's sir. guiding for us, right? And so for the, cent- for the first century preachers, even to the second century, to the third century, the primacy of the cross was because they value uh, the preeminence and the prominence of Christ. So this is important to identify because if you don't value Christ as supreme or uh, preeminent, then you won't preach the cross. But there's another reason why uh, they preach the cross. They, they preach the cross because the cross exposes. Mm-hmm. Um, the cross exposes our humanness. As a matter of fact, the cross exposes our human frailty. Um, th- th- there's this theme that we use in systematic theology in particular when it comes to the aspect of preaching. Um, uh, it's called the fallen condition focus. And so the fallen condition focus pretty much um, I, illustrates the, 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 our fallen nature, uh, that which is corrupted uh, from the fall in Genesis 3. And as a consequence, uh, all of humanity, um, all of the structures, culture is infiltrated by what we call the original sin, by Adam who committed sin and by all, all persons who are born into this world are born into sin and, in, and iniquity. And so what the cross does, the cross is not afraid of exposing your sin. And so that's why they preach the cross, because they need to, they establish that to be saved from sin was to recognize the cross as being the only particular instrument that could save you. Yes, sir. Um, so they weren't afraid of that. And so I think it's important to note that uh, they weren't afraid of recognizing the importance of our sin, sin for nature being exposed. Um, so th- those are several, at least a couple of reasons why the first century uh, thinkers uh, emphasize the cross. You know, they emphasize again on the important importance of Christ, right? They recognize Christ as the important uh, means by which salvation is brought towards. And then secondly, as well too, they recognize uh, the transformative nature, at least power of the cross by which uh, the cross exposes what we ourselves want to hide. Lord Jesus, wow, that's good, that's good. <clears throat> so let's fast forward. 21 centuries later, how has that dynamic changed? Yeah, yeah. I think what has happened in the 21st century church, at least now, as it's been exemplified, I think it's a very broad question because there's so many layers to it. I think one of the things that we have to take into consideration um, is that as the church, uh, it's not that, hmm, as, as the church, I believe that we're not preaching Christ as he should be preached because our perspective of him is different. What, what do I mean by that? I think many of us have possessed a, a, a perspective of Christ that's relegated, that has relegated him only as a moral teacher, as a great thinker. Um, but we don't recognize that he was more than that. Uh, He was the Lagos, as John articulates in his prologue in John 1 and verse 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. John establishes the divinity of Christ as to say that he's not just the the, the word Lagos referring to the intellect, that the reason in flesh, he is God in flesh. And so perhaps maybe, and and, 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 and encompassing of that is that, the assignment of God was to release us from what had us captive. And so what our preaching relegates, or at least what our preaching has formed, is that we're, we're able to preach what the miracles of Christ. You know, we can identify that, you know, he walked on water, he fed the 5,000. And, and that's great. I think that's the, that's the assignment and the work of Christ. But the true work of Christ was to deliver us from what had us in captivity by which we couldn't deliver ourselves from. We need deliverance from death. We need deliverance from the grave. And it was only by the ransom price of the blood that was able to liberate us. So in other words, you cannot preach a Christ that does not address your sin. You cannot preach a Christ that does not expose your carnality. You cannot articulate holistic view of Christ that does not tell us that we can have salvation through him, here it is, exclusively. And so when you relegate Christ to just a moral thinker, you put it in the same categories of other gods who died but have not resurrected. And so I think 
this is a challenge where we cannot allow our teaching to be so inspirational and motivational that we place God in the categories of great thinkers who have no power, right? Good God. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so Lord have mercy. So let me ask you this question. What are the consequences that we're now facing as a result of not engaging in mm. that type of preaching? Mm. Yeah. Oh, boy, man, you're asking, uh, man, you, you're pulling me out tonight. Um, <laughs> <laughs> there, there are many consequences. Uh, one of the consequences is that we do not preach a biblical uh, theology of Christ. And what I mean by that is that we, we rid ourselves um, from really approach and the true nature of how scripture presents Christ holistically. And so when you're not preaching the totality of scripture holistically, the question is then what are you preaching, right? And so therefore uh, as preachers, there, there is, I believe a mandate to ensure that when we're preaching Christ, uh, we're not just preaching a portion of Christ, we're preaching holistic of Christ. And as a consequence, when we don't preach Christ, the people who are feeding only get a particular palette or develop only a, a certain palette um, so that when a preacher who preaches truth about Christ, uh, they have the tendency there to view that preacher as not preaching at all. Uh, well, because you had conditioned your people to accept a view of Christ that's not holistic. And so therefore what it does, it stuns the ability of spiritual maturity amongst our believers. Uh, that's one of the consequences. The second consequence is that we, we create an environment that is church accommodating, but Christless, right? What I mean by a church accommodating, but Christless. Well, what I mean by that is, is that we cultivate an environment where we recognize church. Now, let me say this, church now becomes a religion to us. And so it's a formality. We come to church day in, day out. We do it. You know, we, we, we're able to articulate and even in, in advance, uh, pre know, if I will, if I will, um, what service is going to look like. You know, the preacher's going to preach. He's going to hoop at this section. We're going to dance at this section. And so we have be, we've become accustomed to having church. But in the midst of having church, there is no Christless identity, at least culture filled, or at least uh, cultivated in that space, right? And so as a result, we have believers who are church members, but are not kingdom citizens, mm. right? So they know church, uh, we can do church, uh, we mastered, we, we all have the PhD in doing church, but do we also have a bachelor's degree in, do, in being kingdom citizens? And so even the, the basic um, necessities, if I will, of being believers and understand the kingdom mandate now becomes an abstract distant thought because all we're accustomed to is having church. And so it changes the culture of our assignment and mission as a people. The Bible says, Matthew 28, 19, that we go into the world and make disciples. It's important to note that the, the, the function and verb in that particular uh, verse of Matthew, Matthew 28, 19 is not go, um, but it is make disciples that that's the assignment is to make disciples not church membership no it's to make disciples and so when we don't preach a christ-centered uh, theology we create adherents that are lovers of the church but not of christ or even of the kingdom um, and that's what i think those are the consequences that we somewhat put ourselves into um, as believers and then lastly uh if there is no as if there's not a, a Christ-centered doctrine or theology um, that's being established in the church, then everything else that follows suit is corrupted, or at least in some case can be, you know, it, it, can, it, can, it can experience a level of disruption. You know, how we view our responsibilities to the widows in our social active uh, responsibilities in, in our culture, how we treat one another now becomes distorted and then we create these isms in the church. I don't got time to probably deal with those, but a Christ-centered <laughs> Christ identity um, rids of isms within the church. Um, anything else develops a culture of isms, if I will. It's interesting because one of the things that I've been really thinking about lately are the eighth century prophets. 
And one of the prophets that Jesus quoted the most was an eighth century prophet that was Isaiah. And even though Isaiah, a lot of his message was messianic, um, and he was, he did uh, speak a lot of prophetic judgment, but he also had an element of social justice. So there is, it's almost as if you can't divorce Christ from that subject of social justice. Um, and when you think of social justice, social justice also speaks to personal sacrifice or self-denial, which again is connected to the cross. Yeah. Yeah. So how, how do we navigate those waters? How do we reintegrate those themes into our preaching, into our presentation of the gospel, a cross-centered gospel? A great question and great remarks made. It's interesting that in Luke 4 and verse 18, at the inauguration of Christ's ministry, the Bible says he opens up and he goes to the book of Isaiah, and he reads the particular Psalm, or at least scripture, if I will, from Isaiah. Yes. And he articulates what Isaiah makes mention um, when he says, the spirit of the Lord is upon me, has anointed me to sort of, sort of, you know, heal the sick, open the blind eyes, heal the brokenhearted, um, set the captive free. Um, that, that was his assignment. And it's very interesting to know that his assignment was also attached to being a voice to the voiceless. Why is this important? Because the Jews expected the Messiah to release them from the Roman imperial rule yes, so that they can now return back to this theocratic identity or governance, which, that, which what, what simply means where they were just under the rule of God exclusively. And so their conception of the Messiah was to release them from a political governance. Hence the reason why, you know, the disciples in Acts, as Jesus was ascending, asked him the question, well, when are you going to restore back again the house of Israel? So even though they recognize him as a spiritual savior, they were not rid of their natural physical reality, which simply means that we could also be spiritually filled we, we could have the passion and zeal for christ but yet we can still be living in circumstances that contradicts perhaps our confession that you know we're gonna make it that the lord's gonna deliver us that's true i hear you preach about what do i do with the situation when my bill is not pay, being paid or where i'm going to work and i'm facing racial tensions in that particular space when are you going to restore back your kingdom at least the physical kingdom but What's important to note that Jesus' assignment, he, he, didn't, he did not dismiss them. Yes, His primary assignment was not to, 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 you know, to bring you know, political order, if I will, but a spiritual political order, if I will. But he did not negate the, the, the marginal. That, that, there's a particular scripture, the Bible says, I believe in the book of Matthew, that the, the Pharisees and scribes asked the question, why does he, why does he fellowship with, 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 with publicans and sinners? It's, it's interesting that the Messiah functioned in an environment where people scrutinized, where people scrutinized the sinners, where people scrutinized the lower class. Because in, in the Jewish system, there's a sort of a caste system created, if, if I will. And Jesus found himself in an environment where the marginalized recognized him, which speaks volumes that one of the assignments of the cross is to bring equity and equality to all. It is at the cross. It is at the cross where the, 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 the balance is created. Whether you be Jew, whether you be Gentile, whether you're barbarian, whether you're not barbarian, whether you're male you're, or female, we, there is equality and equity in the cross. And so if we preach the centrality of the cross, we will recognize that every single person, either race or creed, whether it's socioeconomic status, are equal under the cross. That, that can be achieved solely by political legislation or legislation and, and policies. As we see, it doesn't matter what we create, it, it, there can never be an equilibrium, but at the cross, there yes, is. Sir. Right. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. So you're your pastor. I'm sure you mentor other preachers. So what is your, what is the how do you encourage them? How do you admonish them as it relates to this topic? Yeah, I, 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 a great friend of mine, when I was starting off preaching, 
uh, he encouraged me and he said, uh, Ro, whatever you preach, mm-hmm. always find your conclusion or at least the destination at the cross. It doesn't matter if you're preaching Genesis or you're preaching mm-hmm. Revelation. Um, ensure that the message of the gospel of Jesus Christ is being articulated and that the, the cross is the, 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 the destination of your assignment. And I think it's important, as I encourage and mentor preachers, uh, don't preach so that you can increase your fan base. Don't preach so you can increase your social media platform. Don't preach messages that can make you popular and let, let you go viral. You know, just because a preacher is able to put up a fancy topic that may controversial, but that doesn't mean that's your assignment. Preach the text and preach Christ and Him crucified. Don't don't you don't have to be you don't have to be the next Mike Todd or the next Jakes. It, no no, the, the, preach the centrality of the cross. Why? Because as I said before, when you preach the cross, you realize that you are underneath it, so you cannot boast yourself in it. That's why Paul says, I don't make a boast, right? But I boast in the Lord. And, and, I, th- and I think that the, 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 the centrality of that message is when you preach Christ, it's Christ who becomes exalted, not your preaching technique, um, not you being able to find Greek words and Hebrew words that we don't can't understand. And that's great. Don't get me wrong. That's great. But when you preach the cross, you preach hope to the hopelessness, right? Um, don't worry about the hoop. Um, it, it'll come. And if you can do it, you know, it's an art, do what you need to do. Uh, I'm not concerned about style, but, what, but my concern is you can have style and no substance. And it means yes, nothing. Sir. Yes, so sir. I, I encourage young preachers and those who I mentor, um, stick to the message of Christ and let everything else flow out of that. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I want to go back to that was powerful. That, that was powerful. Um, I want to go back to something I asked you before, and that was about the consequence of not preaching a cross-centered gospel. And one of the things that I've been thinking about lately um, is syncretism. One of the consequences of not doing that, not preaching the cross in theology. Would you say that syncretism is, and first of all, for those that are watching that may not know what syncretism is, would you explain to them what syncretism is? And then I'm going to ask you. Um, text, if you would say that that is a consequence of consequence rather of not, us not preaching a cross centered gospel. Yeah, so syncretism in its most, uh, if I will, simplistic definition is the interwoven of two uh, separate ideas that may be foreign from one another and it's merged into one and it creates a new identity. So, for example, I would liken synchroni- syncretism. Uh, synchronism to the whole idea, let's say if, uh, let's say the, the Muslim faith um, in Christianity uh, is somewhat being quote unquote ecumenical, which means aligning and merging with another, and then out of it, it creates this new religion. Well, that's problematic because there are certain particular core values within Christianity that exclusively, you know, um, denies some of the teachings that are, that's within uh, the, the faith of the Quran, at least the book of Quran and, and, and the Muslim faith. Um, and so syncretism in Muslim is two uh, is ideas, two indistinguishable ideas uh, that poses extreme uh, conflict merging to one uh, to create something new. Um, and so we can take a look at culture and see particular things that are, and I use this word, perhaps anti-Christian or anti biblical sound biblical doctrine being infiltrated to merge to one into christianity or into sound doctrine if that will and to create something new um and so yes absolutely i i would argue uh that um once you are not preaching christ then what you do you open yourself to receiving anything else that is not christ Mm -hmm. and so as a result um one of the things i've i've noticed even within the particular present day church um, is this whole notion where the body of Christ can merge and blend with culture um, and call it still Christianity. Now, let me let me kind of say this, that there is nothing inherently wrong with culture in of itself, because we all present some sort of culture. That's right. 
But Christianity has a distinctive sound. Um, it has a distinctive identity. Um, it's centered in a particular distinctive reality by which the exclusivity of Christianity is dependent exclusively on the person of Christ. Uh, uh, Jesus said it in John 14, 14 and 16, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except by through me. Therefore, me, if there's any sort of particular ideology, uh, philosophy, religion that is being run <laughs> Christianity, that therefore states that there is another option to the Father other than Christ, then that's problematic um, and, and should be met with extreme caution. Well, how do we control that? How do we ensure that that does not happen within our preaching? Well, as you mentioned, we preach the exclusivity of the cross. We mm -hmm. emphasize the exclusivity of the cross by which no salvation uh, no salvation plan could be ever made possible without the cross. And it's important, my wife always says this when people ask the question, well, why do someone ask the question, why do people, you know, wh why does bad things happen to good people? And this my wife says, and I love her rep response. She says, who, call, who, who determined that we are good? Who, did, who determined we are good? Wow. Because wow. all have sinned. Yes, all sir. have sinned. So no one is good. Now, just because you may be morally good, that does not mean that your spiritual state is good. So you can be morally good, but yet still bathe in the toxicity of sin, which simply means you can present yourself as being morally right, but spiritually you are in a posture of death. And the only way you can live is if you die. Well, how do you die? Through the cross. So when we look at the cross, the cross is the only infrastructure in any sort of religious, if I will, institution that requires the believers to die so that they can live. <laughs> you must die to live. What do you mean by die? Self-denial. You have to crucify your flesh. So when Jesus said to, to pick up your cross, the question we're asking ourselves to preachers, to communicators, to teachers, and everybody else, are you willing to die? Because you cannot live in Christ until you have died on that cross. And so we rid of particular ideologies that can contaminate Christianity if we are dead. My God, my God. Wow, we, we, <laughs> we've talked around this question all, all, all night, or this, this, the question mother asked you, we've talked around it all night. But let, let me ask you, what, what does it mean or wow what does it mean or how can how can we make the cross real to church to, to the people now because i think now as you talked earlier it's just a story about a great thinker but how do we make the cross real yeah how do you make the cross real i, I think i think that's a great question i think one of the areas and it, it is indeed a great question uh, all right, let, let, let me answer, let me answer this way. So before we get to Matthew 27 and the chapters by which it communicates the, the death of Christ, uh, there is, there is Matthew 26, Matthew 26, the beginning chapters begin with Jesus enter into a town uh, called Bethany, uh, by which he's anointed. Bethany uh, is can also mean you know um, house of affliction, and Jesus is anointed by Mary in a house a place called house of affliction. After he's anointed, he travels and he goes to the Garden of Gethsemane, by which we know the story. He prays, um, he brings his his three trusted disciples, at least I would argue his closest friends, so that they can pray with him as he endures. I believe. Uh, naturally and physically one of the most difficult seasons of his life by far probably the most difficult season of his life and jesus says this question father if it be your will please remove or let this cup pass now the question that we got to ask ourselves is why did jesus use the metaphor or at least the, the, the typology if i will of a cup 
well, as a preacher and as a thinker, you have to ask yourself and challenge yourself, well, perhaps he's taken some sort of liquid substance spiritually. What, 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 and what, 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 what does that look like? I believe that is the toxicity of, 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 of sin that he's going to drink. And, the, and that particular fragrance is a reality that now he has conceptualized that he has to do. At the first time in his humanity, he now accepts the cross, not just as a, dense, a distant thought, but he now accepts the cross as a present reality. Yes, sir. And so at this point in time now, he now realizes that in the, few, in the next few moments that he's going to die. And what's powerful is he knows he will resurrect, but yet at the same time, he was not exempt from the natural reality of pain and what that looks like. Now, what does that tell us about the cross, at least in its practical applications? One thing you mentioned I think is important is that one of the practical applications of the cross is called sacrifice, is sacrifice, which simply means that there are gonna be certain things in our lives that the cross is going to demand us to sacrifice. I don't know what that may be for those who are watching or who may be watching this later online, but the cross will make a demand for you to sacrifice something. And what's and what's challenging about sacrifice? It, it's not a sacrifice if it doesn't cost you anything. It's not a sacrifice if it doesn't cost you some sort of um, a, a visceral feeling of pain and, and of loss. It, it's a sacrifice because it's something that's dear to you. And so one of the challenges is that the cross will demand you to make a sacrifice. Secondly, as I mentioned previously, the reality of the cross is, is that something has to die on it. <laughs> something has to die on it. The cross is not meant to be a jewelry. The cross is not meant to be a presentation of beauty. It was a place of execution. It, it, it was a place that was degraded. It was a shameful place, which simply means that when you take up the cross, you have to be prepared for public shame. You have to be prepared for public degradation. When you pick up the cross, you have to be, for, be prepared for public humiliation. When you pick up the cross, you also have to be prepared for private and public persecution. So the practical applications of the cross is that when we pick up our cross, when we carry our cross, we're not just carrying it so that we could boast. No, we're carrying it as a symbolism of shame. Because when Christ picked up his cross, it was a symbolism of shame. Because for the first century Jew and Gentile, the cross presented this reality of shame because it wasn't a structure that you glamorize I, even though it, it doesn't it doesn't liken to but if i will according to our contemporary language or at least a uh, symbolism the cross would be likened to an electric chair yes sir that's what a cross is likened to an electric chair you tell me if someone will go around with a pendant with an electric chair on their on their chairs no you, you wouldn't naturally do that because of the shame of the sort of tones that it carries and so the, practi the practical application of the cross is shame of degradation, of, of sacrifice, but here is the beauty. The, the, the miracle of the cross, thank you, Holy Spirit, the miracle of the cross presents to us the reality that when I die, resurrection is inevitable. <laughs> so when I pick up the cross, it's also a symbolism that that which I am dying to no longer, ha no longer has the power over me which simply means that when you die, you now have power over the same thing that had you under restriction. So that addiction, when you die with the cross, you have power over that. Um, um, that, that, that drug addiction, that alcoholic addiction, uh, that, uh, that, that, that relationship that, was, you were in, uh, uh, that resulted in promiscuity, you have power over that, 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 that ability to, to curse out folk and to, to, to have double standard mindset towards other things. When you die to the cross, you now have power over the same thing that has that had you bound. This is, why, this is how Paul articulated. Paul says in Corinthians 15, I believe from 50, 55 to 57, he says, oh, death, where is thy sting? 
an old grave where is a victory and the sting of death has been swallowed up, which simply implies in order for you to have victory, you have to die. And so the practical applications of the cross is that victory is contingent upon your state. So if you are dead to sin, you have victory over sin. But if you don't want victory over sin, you will live in sin. And so therefore the grave and death still has power over you. But when you die to the cross, um, I believe that you have victory. So I think it's important to understand that for us believers, while the cross requires sacrifice, in the same breath, it promotes victory. While the cross requires and at least presents the, the, the image of shame and degradation, but in the same particular breath, it tells us that we will reign with Christ. So in yes, order for us to reign, we have to die to something. And the cross is the means where we crucify what had power over us. Um, I think, my and that's the whole. My God, wow, that's rich. That is so rich. So we're going to wind down in a couple of minutes, but I have to ask you this because I think um, it's important. Not only does the cross have soteriological implications, but it has also has eschatological implications. So as we are in the last days and moving toward the last days, what is the relevance of the cross to now, to these last days? Yeah, great question. Um, I believe what the cross does for us, thank you, Holy Spirit, it, it provides us the hope that this too shall pass. Mm -hmm. it, it, it provides us the ability to trust in the one who has conquered the world. And that's what John says. John says, in this world, you will endure suffering, you will experience, but, but, but John says, at least as Jesus articulate, be of good cheer for the one, uh, for, 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 the, for the one who has overcome the world, uh, that's the, as I paraphrase it, that's the one in some case you have your faith and hope built in. Jesus says that we are more than conquerors through him. Well, why, why are we more than conquerors? Well, we're more than conquerors because he died and conquered that which had conquered over, over us. And so in this, as we speak eschatologically, it speaks to this hope that we shall not all perish, yes, sir. Uh, but in a twinkling of an eye, <laughs> we, we shall be raptured. And our hope is that when we are raptured, um, it is not, it, it is, <laughs> It is not something that is a mere coincidence. Um, it, it, is, it is not something that we think is going to happen, but we shall be changed. Yes, sir. And, and the confidence that we have is because he who died did say that I shall repeat, I shall come back again. Yes, sir. And our hope is that the cross that Christ died on, here, here is our hope. Our hope is that the cross that he died on and that he was buried in, at least the grave that he was buried in, is left vacant. There's nobody on the cross no more. Hallelujah. There's nobody in the grave, which therefore means that he will come back and that he did not just die, he rose. And so the emphasis of our hope is that we shall not all sleep, but we shall be changed. And that is only because when he died, his assignment was not just to stay there, but to get up. Wow. Praise God. Powerful. So I think this is my last question. Um, I, I'm a trainer of preachers. And one of the things that I, I tell them is that one of our jobs is to take an ancient text and to make it really live in a modern world. We're bridging the gap between antiquity and modernity, right? right. So how do we bridge the gap between that ancient story of the cross to modernity? How do we merge those two? How do we make great that question. live? Yeah, great, great question. I think one of the assignments for the preacher, and, and you, there's so many ways you can take it. I think much more in a more technical way, uh, the preacher must have the skills, um, at least the exegetical skills and resources to 
be able to honestly understand the cross in light of its original hearers and audience. I think that's very important. That the process of exegesis is to extract from uh, what has been originally communicated, exegesis or eisegesis is to somewhat as articulate to read into, right? And so where you're, where you provide an exegetical analysis is by which you are now allowing your presuppositions to exclusively determine what the text says. Whereas in the exegetical analysis, by which you are allowing the text uh, to speak for itself, where you are extracting, um, uh, you are extracting the original meaning, uh, intent, voice, language, etc., from the original uh, writer and to whom he was writing to. Yes, sir. And so when we look at the cross, at least will we at least try to provide sound exegesis? We must also understand that from even from the Old Testament, the cross was a fulfillment of what nobody, what a sacrifice couldn't fulfill, right? So that's why the Hebrew said, um, the Bible says that this man, when he made the sacrifice for all sins, he sat down, which implies that everybody else up until that time had to work in order, for, in order for them to be cleansed. They had to work in order for them to be redeemed. But this man, when he sat down, he paid, he, he made a sacrifice that was to sacrifice for all. And I think it's important for preachers that it's important to understand the centrality, the importance of the cross. Here it is as it would have been understood by its original hearers, that being the Jews. Why did Paul says that it's a stumbling block? They can't, they can't conceptualize how the cross is the particular element by which all sins are being made. They can't, they can't conceptualize that's a stumbling block to the Jews. And so for the preacher, um, it, it, it requires skill. It requires a level of posture of humility uh, to take the meaning of an ancient practice, right? Because it is an ancient practice because the cross uh, wasn't developed by the Romans. Um, I believe it was the Syrians or the Persians who uh, first implemented this cross type execution. The Romans just perfected it. Um, but I think it's important to note that when we look at the Old Testament, we, we see that Christ had to be the perfect lamb, the perfect lamb in order for God, in many, many, where God's wrath or God's justice had to be completed. And so we see that theme of sacrifice in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, we see Christ as the fulfillment of that sacrifice. And so it's taken certain particular typologies, symbolisms, um, and concepts that we see in the Old Testament, and we see how Christ beautifully um, and intentionally uh, fulfills their prophecies um, in the persons and in the way that he did. Praise God. So powerful. Would you, you have to come back one day. You have to, if you would. You have Absolutely. To. I'll be honest. So, so if you would, just in 60 seconds, 90 seconds, what, what last thoughts would you like to leave with those that are watching? Yeah. Whatever's on your heart, what would you like to share? Absolutely. Uh, I, I would say this. I, I think it's important that as believers, that the cross doesn't just remain on our necklaces. Mm. That as believers, the cross is not just what we get on our bodies and what we get on our coffee mugs. I, my petition, my beseech, is to as believers to refrain from commercializing the cross um, and that we understand the value and the magnitude of this great sacrifice. Christ didn't just die, he was crucified. Yes, sir. And I said, Christ did not just die, he was crucified. When I say crucifixion, it speaks to the reality that he was intentionally gone, he intentionally went through a process to which his body was broken. Um, he was nailed to the cross. And please understand, he was not nailed uh, with his palms. He had to be nailed through his wrists so that his body doesn't rip, his hand doesn't rip through, due to the weight of his body. 
and he was crucified in the most shameful, the most degrading way that you can think. That the, the worst means of death was reflected in Jesus's crucifixion. And he did that. It was the assignment of the Father to go through that process so that those of us who pick up our cross, we understand the magnitude of suffering. We understand the magnitude of what it means to carry the cross, but here is our hope. Jesus says that those who suffer with him shall reign with him. So yeah. Don't be afraid of carrying your cross. Um, take pride in it because also he's helping you carrying it as well too. Wow. As, as you were just talking, two things came to mind. The first thing came to my mind was when I visited Israel and mm. they, they took us to Golgotha and they showed us how what they perceived to be Golgotha. There are two areas that they think of Golgotha, but the one that our tour guide believes was Golgotha because it was done in a public place so that really Jesus could be in an open shame. So bat, pot, bat bypassers could actually see what was happening. And he talked about that idea of the shame that he was exposed before the world and how he did that simply because not only was he fulfilling prophecy, but we, he was committed to our salvation. And yeah, that was yeah. really the, the epitome of God's love for us, that he was willing to go to the next extent um, for that. Uh, the other thing that came to my mind was what history says about Peter, that Peter, the Bible or history says that Peter wanted to be crucified upside down because he didn't think he was worthy to die in the same manner that Jesus died because he understood the worth of the sacrifice and the value of what Jesus did. And so as I'm reflecting upon that, it is my hope and my prayer that as you said so eloquently, I couldn't say it as eloquently as you did, but as eloquently as you said it, that we get back to the place where the cross is not just some abstract theory or idea, but it becomes the reality of who we are, what we do and why we do what we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. I concur. Yeah, yeah. If you would, man of God. First of all, I want to thank you for joining us tonight all the way from Canada. You don't have to do that. You don't know me from Adam. This is the first time we're friends on Facebook, friends on IG. This is the first time we've ever seen each other, quote unquote, face to face. You don't know me from Adam, um, but by the spirit, I believe we know one another. Um, but this is the first time we've ever connected. So I'm, I honor you. I appreciate you. You are a treasure trough of knowledge. I have another brother. Uh, Pastor Anthony Dix, I think if y'all got together, it would All be right. pandemonium because he's a he's a brain that's just ridiculous. It would be nuts if the two of you got together. Right. Um, I have another brother, Covenant Brothers watching. A few of them are watching. Prophet Chaston Burns, um, Apostle Gerard Brown, they're watching. But one, one in particular, Pastor Will Brandon, while you were talking, he said, please tell this preacher to stop. He couldn't take it. You him out. <laughs> but this is so powerful. I believe uh, my pastor says of me, my bishop says of me, he says, if you want to get buried, go and start talking about Jesus. And I guess I'm kind of guilty. Um, but I believe I made a commitment to my mentor who died in 2018. Actually, while I was in Israel, she passed away. She was 103. Wow. And one of our last conversations, or should I say one of our conversations in the last years of her life, I said to her that I made a promise to God that I would always preach Jesus. And she started quickening. Um, and so that is, for me, that is life. Without yeah. Jesus, there is no gospel. Without Jesus, there is no reason to preach. And so it is my prayer that God would raise up people that are committed to the name of Jesus and the life, the death, the burial, and the resurrection and the second coming of Jesus, because that would, that's what puts the seals on all of this. So I'm excited about you, man of God. I appreciate you. So if you would, just pray. Just pray as you're led. Hallelujah. Dear Lord, we are so grateful. We are honored. Hallelujah. For this conversation. Father, this is not coincidental. This is not fate. This wasn't an accident, Lord. I believe that you divinely instituted this connection even before the foundation of time, even before the foundation of our Reverend Barry Elliott, even before you created me and formed me into a zygote, Lord, you knew that we would connect at this particular moment in the history of our existence. And for this reason, God, we are eternally grateful for what, for what you have done and will continue to do amongst us. Father God, firstly, I want to admonish you, Lord, because I want to uh, articulate, Lord, that we are grateful that you have brought us into a space, Lord, where 
We can have a conversation that has become taboo. We, we can have a conversation, Lord, concerning you that is no longer actually happening in its fullness, even in our churches. But Father God, I believe, Lord, that which you have created, uh, the, the, this visionary to do, the CEO to do, God, to create this space where sound biblical, Hallelujah. sound theological Lord. conversations that are Holy Spirit led and filled, Lord. You have created him, Lord, to be the producer, to be the creator, to be the brain behind something that this earth has not experienced. And Father, we are praying, God, that you will eternally bless this ministry, bless this organization, God, expand it in the areas of its financial endeavors, expand it in its reach. As a matter of fact, Lord, we exalt you, Lord, because this ministry has an international reach. It was able to captivate a Canadian all the way in Canada, which speaks to the international scope of this ministry. And Lord, we pray that this is just the beginning of what is, uh, this is just the beginning of what you're about to pour into in the next few years of this ministry. Father, I pray God that you will eternally bless him, keep his mind, keep his ministry, God. I pray God that you will allow him to recognize that his voice is relevant and that his voice is needed to communicate the truth of your word. Father, we trust for what, just for what you have been doing, what you will continue doing, what you have done. And we know, God, that you are glorified. Why? Because our self was not exalted. We did not communicate our own interests, our dreams, our personal goals, Lord, but we communicate the interests of the Father, the missio deo, that is the mission of God, that is the crucifixion of Christ, so that salvation by all means could be reached to those who believe in your Son, Jesus Christ. And I pray, God, that anyone that will be watching this will understand that the gospel is made digestible for them, that they can receive Christ even wherever they are planted, while they are driving to work, while they are listening to this in whatever means and whatever platform, that they are able to encounter and experience the Son of the living God. Father, we give you the glory and we give you the name, give, the, give you the praise for the most potent name that exists on this Hallelujah. earth that still has power. Glory to God. Hallelujah. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Jesus. We tell you thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Bless you, man. Appreciate you. If Wow. I received that. I, I receive. I, I heard you and I receive it. Amen. If, if you would tell tell the, the, our viewers where they can follow you on social media. Absolutely, man. Um, if you choose to follow me, um, do so at your own discretion. Um, <laughs> you, can go ahead and, <laughs> you can go ahead and follow me. Uh, I'm on Facebook at Rohan, I believe, K. Samuels. I'm on Facebook and also on Instagram, uh, where I usually uh, i am more and more active on Instagram and Twitter as well, too, at RK Samuels on Instagram. And I believe on Twitter, I'm, on the, I'm the same as well, too. Um, but uh, I mean, more importantly than me, uh, our, our ministry is also here. Uh, I pastor church, Freedom Life Church here in Canada. We're also on Facebook uh, and on YouTube and on Instagram. And so uh, if you wish to connect, um, we would love to connect with you. Thank you so much. If you follow him on Instagram, get ready to be challenged. That's all I'm going to say to you. Just, <laughs> just get ready because he brings the heat. <laughs> just, just prepare yourself. But to all of our viewers, thank you for tuning in tonight. Again, Pastor Samuels, Pastor Rowe, as you're known, thank you for your heart. Thank you for your wisdom. Thank you for your intellect. But most important, thank you for your commitment to the call, to the, to call, to the call of Christ. And thank you for your commitment to the gospel. We appreciate you, man. Um, I've been blessed by this conversation. I want you to know that I hope you have. I pray that it has not been a waste of your time because I've really been blessed by this conversation. To our viewers, Thank you for following us month after month. We'll see you again next month at some point. Um, thank you for your time. Thank you for the pleasure of your time, as I often say. And you all have a great night. Awesome.